Hello and welcome. I'm Valerie Paley, Senior Vice President and Sue Ann Weinberg, Director of the Trisha D. Klingenstein Library at the New York Historical Society. I'd like to begin by thanking Louise Muir, our President and CEO, Agnes Zhu Tang, Chair of the Board of Trustees, and Pam Schaffler, our Chair Emerita, and all of our trustees, in particular the champions of our library, the late Patricia D. Klingenstein, Sue Ann Weinberg, and Sidney Lapidus. We also acknowledge the generosity of the Mellon Foundation, the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation, Helen and the late Robert Appel, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, along with our Chairman's Council, our members, and our many other donors. None of the work of New York Historical is possible without your continued and committed support. The Patricia P. Klingenstein Library at New York Historical is one of the oldest, most distinguished research libraries in the United States. It holds millions of books, newspapers, maps, manuscripts, prints, photographs, and architectural drawings and collections. It is a vital center, center of research into the history of New York and the nation. Key to that research is the presence of a yearly rotation of scholarly fellows, both in residence and in a short-term capacity. Our fellows are engaged in advancing knowledge as they mine New York Historical's collections for new ways of interpreting the American past. We are most fortunate to have them in our midst. Tonight's program will give you just a taste of the quality of work that is being done. New York in 1860, City on a Precipice, will last approximately 45 minutes, including 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end, which you can submit via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen at any point during the presentation. Please do. The chat function has been disabled, so please do make sure to use the Q&A. After the presentation, we will get to as many questions as time allows. This evening, I will be joined in conversation by Joshua K. Leon, the 2022-23 Robert David Lyon Gardner Fellow at the New York Historical Society. Joshua currently serves as Chair of Political Science and International Studies at Iona University. A doctorate in political science, he writes on global governance, development, poverty, global health, and urbanization. He has written for scholarly venues, including Third World Quarterly, Journal of, America, of Urban History, City Planning Perspectives, Peace Review, Cities, and Cambridge Review of International Affairs. His book, The Rise of Global Health, The Evolution of Effective Collective Action, was released in 2015, and he is currently working on a book manuscript of 140,000 words titled World Cities in History, Power and Statecraft in City Life from Uruk to Amsterdam. He is also working on another manuscript called New York, 1860, City on a Precipice, which is under contract with Columbia University Press and serves as the basis for tonight's discussion. Welcome, Josh. Now, uh, let's start by- uh, Hello. Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here, and I'm so excited to speak with you about, about your research and this manuscript that you've been working on for the year at New York Historical. Um, so let's start by, by um, talking about the purpose, the argument of the book, and why write a book about this time and place in particular? Okay, wonderful. Well, first, thank you so much for having me. Um, Thank you to the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation, uh, my wonderful editor Stephen Wesley at Columbia Press, who's just been um, the the he, all, he's just been a wonderful editor who's um, helped uh, me along as I kind of developed these ideas. Um, so, yeah, uh, why write a book about this uh, particular time and place? Um, well, um, New York 1860 is um, about uh, it's a biography of New York City. Um, over one year of its life. And um, the time and the place uh, signify the last days of uh, a dying world where the direction of history is uh, unknown, fluid. It's a time and place where change um, is possible. Um, and so um, the book really, uh, I think, um, uses the time and place to um, give us a kind of granular detail um, in one city, in one place, a kind of street level analysis. Um, so there's a quote that I start the book with, or I'm planning on starting the book with, um, and um, it's by Gramsci um, from a different time and place, but I think it fits uh, so well. Um, the old world is dying and the new one is waiting to be born. Now is a time of monsters. And Gramsci, uh, who was an Italian uh, theorist, 
um, uses that uses that quote to kind of describe what he calls the interregnum, right? Um, where we're on at the end of one period and the beginning of another period. Um, and so um, the time and place, I think, is really interesting to me because uh, I, I think everybody kind of knew one way or another that um, things were shaking loose, things were going to change uh, in one way or another. Um, so uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, William Seward, um, all one way or another in their speeches and speech work, um, they talk about how, um, you know, either the country is going to become all slave or it's going to become all free. Uh, and um, so, you know, I think, you know, everybody knows that there's there's some kind of tectonic shift going on underneath their feet, but nobody knows exactly what that is going to be. And sometimes people prefer not to know or not to pay attention, right? Um, so this book really takes us through uh, kind of the fog of history. And um, just a, a little bit about the book in particular, um, it covers what I call the long year 1860. So it begins with John Brown's raid on uh, Harper's Ferry in October of uh, uh, 1859. And um, then each chapter from there is of a month counting down to uh, the Civil War. And then it concludes um, with the spring of 1861 with shots fired on, on Fort Sumter. And I, I, I haven't written that last chapter yet. I'm about three chapters in, but the last chapter, I, I'm just dying to write, you know, Walt Whitman stepping out of the, the opera. He's just heard Verdi. And the newsboys are saying shots fired, shots fired in Fort Sumter, shots fired in Charleston, right? So they're, those are the only shots that are fired in this book. Um, part of my feeling is that the preludes almost matter the most. Once wars start, kind of all bets are off, right? So that's the time. Um, and the place, I think, uh, is also equally significant. Um, there was no battle fought in New York City, uh, but but for years, and especially through 1860, um, we had had a kind of civil war of words. Um, so New York is the place where so many of these, it's the factory for, for words, right? It's the factory for argument. Um, and so um, it, it's the way to get into kind of the um, antebellum mind. Um, it was a place where, um, you know, it was mostly, mostly um, it, it voted against Lincoln uh, in the election. Um, it was mostly democratic and the democracy, the democratic party was the conservative party. It's a bastion of pro-slavery uh, sentiment, but also a bastion of abolitionism. So we're in the crux or the crucible of um, this kind of clash of ideas uh, headed into uh, the Civil War. So New York is a city where the mayor favored succession, right? Um, and in the concluding chapter, um, the mayor at that time um, is going to give a speech calling for New York to succeed uh, along with the South. So you have, you know, this kind of revolutionary city where you've got radical ideas taking form, um, but you don't have a revolutionary city unless you have the old regime, and they're all in one place. Um, and so New York, much like today, was kind of a window on the world. Um, mm -hmm. This was the media capital then as now. Um, key figures were giving speeches here. Um, they were in the orbit of New York. Um, February 27th, 1860 is a speech that changed, changes the world by Abraham Lincoln, for example. Um, and that was like the Cooper, the Cooper Union speech. That's right, yeah. the Cooper right, Union yeah. speech, um, mm -hmm. which he gave at, at what was then called Cooper Institute. Now it's called Cooper Union. Um, mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, it, it it didn't seem at the time like a speech that was going to tilt our world on its on its axis, but it but it really did. Um, so let let's pause there for a moment. So it's, it's wonderful that you've set it up. So it's not a foregone conclusion necessarily that the Civil War will happen. So we're just seeing it month by month, um, and we're seeing this this year of change, as you say. Uh, and it's a great structure for I think for a book because it, it leads the reader on the way. Um, you know, people living in that moment uh, might have lived, you know, seeing the news. But I'm, I'm just curious, 
what the, your greater argument is though about, uh, about this time and place. Why did you select it and what's your argument about it? Oh yeah, yeah, right. So um, you know, the 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 argument kind of underlying the whole book is that New York was a revolutionary city like St. Petersburg in 1917 or Paris in 1879, um, like many cities in 1848, and that it ought to be looked at that way. Um, so, you know, this was one of those periods where the city was generating and fermenting kind of rapid right change. Um, and so that's kind of the explicit argument that kind of gets built and gathers throughout the book that I'm try trying to persuade you of, right? Um, but there's also a lot of underlying arguments in the book um, that um, history is lived as, in, is as important as history that's made, right? So the method in the book is kind of to show all these kinds of events, how they were sort of perceived by people uh, living in New York City at the time. Um, so that there's kind of an underlying sort of sort of populism to the book. Um, it has people at all levels. Um, it takes a lot of time to sort of develop what things kind of concerned or interested people, um, people living in New York City uh, without the benefit, right, of hindsight or foresight. Um, so it's a, a kind of unique method in sort of, um, you know, presenting the history. Um, another thing that sort of underlies it, you know, I think um, is that, you know, there are kind of parallels um, between then and now, right? So I think, you know, none of the book is about 2023, but I think, um, you know, by going back to this period, um, we see the kind of parallels, um, the absolutist politics, the uncertainty, the extreme ideas. Um, so, so part of it is that there's an echo to um, US history, um, but on another kind of level um, that the past is a foreign country. So it spends a lot of time showing what's different, um, that the 19th century had an ethic, a language, a logic all its own. So many books I think apply the kind of presentism or modern logic, um, but this book tries to really get under that um, and look at what drove and what motivated this time and place. Um, it's gonna be very, very different, right? Um, mm -hmm. And um, the other, I think, big implicit argument that's developed in the book is that, you know, culture matters. Um, the everyday life is imbued in politics. Um, so it's going to emphasize Walt Whitman as much as it's going to emphasize Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. So, so you've spoken a little bit about your, your methodology, but um, which, and your approach, which is, um, you know, very, very interesting, very coherent, but why use it? Why, why take that approach as opposed to a different one? All right, yeah. Um, so um, I should say more about the approach first. I mean, it's a okay. narrative history. <laughs> it's a narrative history. You know, you hear like certain books read like a novel. Usually that means, well, they're well written and accessible <laughs> and things like that. Um, this book really does read like a novel. Um, so, you know, by the time you're finished with the book, um, you know, you've kind of developed a relationship with these various figures from history. Some quite famous, um, some were famous in their own time, but aren't now, and some were never famous, right? Um, so it kind of uses these stories to give us the feel, right? To get into the character, um, to kind of let 1860 uh, sort of speak for itself. So it really does, um, and, and credit Columbia University Press and my editor for um, really getting behind an unusual book like this in that sense, right? Because mm -hmm. it's far more show than it is tell. Um, so it uses a lot of vignettes. Um, it uses a lot of these sort of story developments to see how people made the history and how the history kind of uh, changed them. So it's yeah. placing together um, events from the record, um, primary and secondary sources. Um, I spend, you know, um, a lot of my days reading the papers as if I were reading the papers in 2023, right? Um, so, you know, we're looking at how time passes from day to day to day to day. Um, sure. So, 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 so um, um, show, show us, as opposed to tell yeah. us, oh, show and tell us about the setting then, uh, the, the city as this media capital. Um, how is that 
significant to the to the how does this underpin your narrative? Um, absolutely. So um, you know, New York then is now was um, really um, you know it, it was a, a the, the 19th century equivalent of the global city. Um, this was by far uh, the media capital. And a lot of innovations had taken place uh, in the first half of the 19th century. Um, steam presses could pump out papers, you know, copy after copy after copy after copy. And you had this part of Manhattan. Now, mind you, we have a city of about 800,000 people in Manhattan. That's New York. Um, Brooklyn is a separate city. Together, they have a population of about a million people. This really compact city where you could walk from end to end of, of the densely populated places. So outside City Hall, you had um, this place called Park Row, uh, where, um, you know, a lot of, of newspapers were based one after another after another. Um, and so, um, you know, New York really has its sort of... Um, eyes on the world through these kinds of rival rival presses. And that gives you the opportunity to kind of see how New Yorkers saw the world and vice versa. So you have papers like uh, the New York Herald, um, which was staunchly pro-slavery, um, which, you know, in, in, in the wake of uh, John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, um, they, they actually misidentified it as a slave insurrection. And we're saying things like, well, in previous slave insurrections like Nat Turner's, the scourging and the hanging and the shooting worked, right? Like pretty extreme positions. Um, not too far from that was the New York Tribune. Uh, the New York Tribune was this kind of intellectually exploratory paper um, that was the, it was the most powerful name in news at that time. Um, Horace Greeley was the famous uh, 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 publisher and editor of it. And um, to give you an idea of the difference of ideas, right? I mean, um, the New York Tribune was publishing Karl Marx. Um, he was contemporary at this time and he was their highest paid foreign contributor. Contributor, You had the day book, which is actually right next door to the Tribune. Um, and if there was any doubt about their white supremacy, um, they later changed their name to the Daily Caucasian. God. Um, <laughs> okay. And so you had um, all these major, um, um, you know, newspapers, uh, you had weeklies like Harper's Weekly, the most powerful name in weekly news, right? And, um, you know, New Yorkers were, you know, busily competing with one another to kind of write out this first draft um, of history. And within that, you have a lot of major figures. Uh, Thomas Nast is a young illustrator at this time. Um, and he, you know, gives us an opportunity to kind of, you know, get an understanding of the world we're living in because he's, he's, you know, an up and coming illustrator. He's 19 years old. Um, this pretty funny sort of um, um, figure, right, um, who gets made fun of a lot, but he's quite talented and so, so good at kind of placing himself in history using these opportunities that, you know, of living and being in New York City. He was a German immigrant and, and was brought over as a child, right? Um, so, and his images too were, um, could read be read across different you know, nationalities and, and literacy rates, right? Um, that was part of his potency. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. same, same year he, he sees the first heavyweight championship fight, uh, international heavyweight championship fight, Shake hand, shakes hands with Giuseppe Garibaldi because that because the Italian unification was happening, right? Um, and that was the one civil war which most people seem to agree on, right? Because Garibaldi <laughs> was sort of a revered uh, um, figure uh, in the United States. Um, and then he finally makes it back to the United States uh, during that time. So, so part of his 1860 is spent um, really living world history, right? He gets back in time for Lincoln's visit as president-elect uh, and um, that's February 1861. Um, he gets a chance to shake hands with Abraham Lincoln and illustrate that. So, so New York in 1860 afforded quite a year for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, as a result, it turns up quite a lot in biographies, um, in retrospectives and things like that among the people who are living in it. 
Well, talk, talk just a little bit about those people. Um, what mattered, what, what events of the time mattered the most to um, New Yorkers? Um, do you have a sense from, from your research? Oh, absolutely. Um, happening outside uh, the city, I think um, Harper's Ferry and the raid on Harper's Ferry was a signal event. Um, you have um, the newspapers um, just, you know, they, 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 they are publishing this with great interest. Um, at, uh, back in New York, there are visuals um, for John Brown and the New York Herald, of course, is naming names, whether they were actually implicated in Harper's Ferry or not. Um, and um, Cooper's Cooper Union, which has just been formed, right? Um, uh, it's quite a new institution at this time. Um, speeches left and right on all sides of, of this debate. Uh, so I think John Brown and Harper's Ferry tilts uh, the city on its axis, right? That's an external event, but. In the city, I think, um, you know, people's attention was really turned. Um, the um, um, major events are things like um, the Japanese embassy visit in um, June. Uh, the, um, th this is described through the lens of um, an everyday New Yorker, Philip Hamilton Hill, um, and I can't wait to put this in the book. Full disclosure, people, I'm on March. That's the chapter I'm working on. We aren't quite to June yet. This is, you know, a, a project that's ongoing. But um, I mean, this is one of the biggest events in the city um, up to that time. Um, around the same time, uh, the biggest ship in the world visited. New Yorkers were lining up um, to, go, to go see it. It was called the Great Eastern. Uh, the Prince of Wales uh, visited, who became the first, uh, the future King uh, Edward. And that was the most significant uh, diplomatic visit to New York City at that time. It got far more publicity than Lincoln did. And Lincoln wasn't without publicity in February, right? Um, and uh, so um, the Prince of Wales visit, um, the Japanese emb embassy together have hundreds of thousands of people on the street. And in um, this figure I really like, who I've gotten to make friends with, Philip Hamilton Hill, he's describing how he's, you know, running through these crowds trying to get a view of the Japanese embassy, um, how he uh, uh, um, is, is doing much the same, right, uh, with the Prince of Wales visit. Um, and so um, the Prince of Wales visit was also divisive. Um, the Irish community, in New York, um, the largest uh, immigrant group really isn't that happy about um, a British royal coming and getting fed it. Um, one pretty significant uh, Irish political boss is like, I will not march for this man um, and, and, and be in the, the procession. Yeah. Elmer Ellsworth, who becomes the first casualty of um, for the North during uh, the Civil War, uh, comes to town and everyone, um, you know, all the women are, um, you know, they, they see this guy, he's been being written about in the papers as this dashing figure. He has this unit that would dress up in French Algerian uniforms called the Zouaves, mm -hmm. who would be very easy targets at Bull Run because those sure. are completely <laughs> ill-adapted to... <laughs> Uh, 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 battle conditions. With a little fez America, cap right? and, the, and the pantaloons. Yeah. And all right. um, exactly. He comes yeah. in July and it it is, you know, quite a lot of fanfare, right? Um, you know, sadly, you think about it that, you know, we're, we're seeing this kind of jolly procession of military figures. 22,000 New Yorkers are going to die in this coming conflagration. Of course, the election was... Um, you know, the city was uh, uh, um, quite a boisterous place during the election season. Dickens came to write about it, uh, Charles Dickens. Um, you know, so it, it was a quite quite a lively place. The, the embassy visit, the Prince of Wales visit, all those things get into a poem by Walt Whitman, which is called Year of Meteors. It, it, it you know, it was about the year 59 to 60, but in, you know, all these all those issues get into it, all those events get into it. And, um, you know, some of them are forgotten today, but 
you know, if you'd have asked Philip Hamilton Hill or other people in New York, what was the most important thing to happen? Few would have said the Cooper Union speech. Interesting. Um, yeah. Many would have said uh, the Prince of Wales visit or or mm -hmm. the Japanese embassy, right? Right. Well, it's interesting. You know, we were talking about North and South and 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 the the civil war that would be um, on the horizon. Uh, but we also know that uh, you know New York is democratic and uh, did not go with Lincoln. So I I'm curious, what were they saying in the South about New York, which we think of as such a northern city now? Uh, uh, yeah, um, one of the interesting continuities. Um, everyone's always talking about New York. Um, New York uh, um, was not, uh, you know, we, we think of New York as this kind of city that's known for its liberal sentiment and so on. Um, not the case uh, in 1860. Mm -hmm. So um, Southern um, newspapers were coming to New York um, and they called it the black and white list. Uh, they would put together a list of businesses that had you know, showed any kind of sympathy for abolitionism um, or in their minds showed any kind of sympathy for abolitionism. Um, and, you know, they would um, pointedly kind of say, well, you shouldn't do business here, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, Edmund Ruffin, who at least took personal credit for firing on Fort Sumter that day, he was in his 60s, uh, wrote a novel in the middle of, in the middle of, um, um, the year called Anticipations. It was really a, a lousy science fiction novel um, in which he says the grass will grow, right? He imagines Lincoln being elected and uh, he imagines um, what would happen to New York, a city with dense ties to the South, right? Financially. Um, and he says the grass will go grow in the streets. In case you think that's an original line, it's not. <laughs> Also about the year, people were 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 uh, um, both north and south were saying without slavery, grass will grow in the streets. To give you an idea, um, I mean, um, the you know uh, population that this is one of the most slave dependent societies um, mm -hmm. in world history. Uh, so Keith Hopkins, who wrote um, the one of the few world histories of slavery cites the West Indies, cites ancient Greece and Rome, um, cites Brazil and the American South as the five most slavery dependent um, um, societies in the world. So New York is being tarred by the South on the one hand as kind of a place that continues to tolerate abolitionism. Um, in New York, business leaders are saying, um, you know, we, we have to tamp down the abolitionism. We have to tamp down the criticisms of slavery. Um, otherwise, we will lose our meal ticket, right? Um, the <laughs> entire monetary value of slaves um, outstripped um, that of all the banking finance, um, all the factories um, combined. Uh, in the United States, uh, other than land, which of course slaves are working, this is the most valuable collection of property. Um, and so um, in the South, um, anti-Northern sentiment ran rife. There's an incident in the book where just for traveling South and being perceived as an abolitionist, um, an Irish worker named James Power, who was, you know, kind of a migrant worker throughout in the South, traveling through the South, crashes into the Tribune office on Christmas day after he just escaped the South with his life. He still had scars from a tarring and feathering um, because um, in Charleston in South Carolina, um, he made an off the cuff remark um, that made people perceive him as um, an abolitionist, which he swore up and down he was not. Um, also, the, the Tribune was circulating a book called Hinton Helper's Impending Crisis of the South, um, which is actually a pretty dry read about how, um, you know, uh, slavery was actually holding the South back, right? A direct appeal to the Southern states, a kind of conservative argument, right, um, mm -hmm. that um, was intended to persuade 
Southerners to want to abolish slavery. Um, mm -hmm. The book was thoroughly banned um, at this time, and the New York presses were under a lot of fire for, um, especially the Tribune, for kind of distributing this book. Um, so, um, you know, New York was very much in the crosshairs uh, of real, uh, as, as a, a bastion of real or perceived abolitionism and a place that with the Fugitive Slave Act enacted um, that just wouldn't return slaves who escaped, right? Um, and so uh, um, there was a lot of antipathy toward um, New York um, at this time. So uh, we actually we have so many uh, questions coming up in the chat, but I want to just ask you a few more before we go to the, oh, sure. the questions. And that is, um, so we, we you danced around this a little bit, but I'm curious about the the people, famous and not so famous people that are that are featured in this in this year, uh, who are who are. Who of, of your characters is having a really Absolutely. good year in 1860? Absolutely. Um, there, there's so many interesting figures who had kind of big years um, in 1860. Um, we've talked about Lincoln's visit and the Cooper Union, uh, Cooper Union address. Um, that was very brief. Um, Walt Whitman has quite an adventure. Uh, the poet, uh, Walt Whitman, um, and he also is a person who is living this time um, in history. He publishes the 1860 edition of uh, Leaves of Grass. It underwent multiple editions. Um, and so um, Walt Whitman is at 163 Broadway. The, the Brown visited New York a few times, but during the time span I write about, um, the only time he visits is in a casket. Um, and you can go down to um, 163 Broadway, which is now Chinatown. That's where John Brown's body, after he was hung, um, that's where um, uh, John Brown's body was in, embalmed, right? Um, and so the um, Philadelphia wouldn't have him. Uh, it was too hot you know, to, it, it was going to inspire too much unrest, right? So the mayor is like, get this out of here. So everyone's lining up to see um, John Brown's body um, at this time. And of course, there was the famous song written about John Brown's body. And one of the people in line is Walt Whitman. And um, he is standing next to a kind of... No Whitman was not an abolitionist, um, but... Um, Richard Hinton, who was writing about John Brown and quite a partisan toward John Brown, was saying, hey, you've got these poems. Um, you should consider um, publishing with this publisher, Thayer and Eldridge. They're really offbeat, right? <laughs> um, and so that's the genesis for how um, Leaves of Grass found its publisher. Um, Whit Whitman was not particularly a, a strong voice against slavery, but um, he was sufficiently um, offbeat in his poetry, like so out of line with what's being written, that this devil may care type of a press was like, you know, we proudly would like to publish your work. Um, so he ends up going to Boston where he's talking to Emerson uh, and um, they're walking through the public garden and he gets warned by Emerson who's saying, um, you should really tone down the sexual content of this. This is like something that's going to, you know, generate you a lot of bad publicity. But the publishers at Thayer and Eldridge at this time um, were harboring fugitives from Harper's Ferry. You know, they were uh, um, sending money to Mary Brown and even planning a jailbreak of some other other uh, figures involved. Um, in the raid on Harper's Ferry, which, if you don't know, was a uh, uh, um, this this uh, attempt by John Brown and his band to confiscate weapons and eventually uh, um, create uh, free slaves, right? Um, and so um, Thayer and Eldridge, the press, was like, "No, we like it as it is." Um, <laughs> <That's crazy. laughs> yeah, <That's> so quirky. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so you no, I mean, God, we're, we we could talk forever oh, about sure, this, but sure. I just want you to. Um, Tell me a little bit about, about some other characters. I know you've got artistic characters and uh, bohemian characters and pro-slavery, abolitionist, uh, politicians, and then some not famous people too. Like who, who might 
who are your favorites of, of, of the, the really enormous cast of characters that are in this book? Oh, um, some, some great contrast. Uh, the most popular artist at the time, this was kind of an American Renaissance. I mean, um, you know, there was a lot of artistic ferment uh, going on. Um, Frederick Edwin Church was the most popular artist at that time. And the painting Heart of the Andes, um, around the same time as John Brown, was attracting tens of thousands of uh, uh, viewers to see Heart of the Andes. By the way, at Historical Society, you have Kayambi on display uh, around the corner from the library. That was from 1858, right? Mm -hmm. uh, also from Frederick Church's travels through Central America. Um, Frederick Church is um, um, also having a kind of interesting year, right? Um, because 30,000 people go to see his The Heart of the Andes in Boston. Um, he's getting tons of notoriety and decides he hates it, right? Um, he won't answer his door at one point, or, or so they allege. Um, Emmanuel Loitz, uh, who paints um, Washington Crossing the Delaware, um, is uh, um, fresh off uh, some renewed fame for painting a portrait of Roger Taney. Kind of how politics and culture intersects, Roger Taney wrote the majority decision for the Dred, Dred Scott case, where he says uh, um, that um, African Americans have no rights to which the white man was bound to respect. Erastus Dow Palmer um, is the second most popular artist at this time. Um, and he is, uh, he called, carves out the sculpture called White Captive, which, dis, which conveys um, the image of a white woman enslaved by uh, uh, um, Native Americans. Um, and it was, you know, it was given the works, right? Even like lighting to, to sort of make the skin of it look um, real. And uh, my favorite favorite out of all of those is um, John Rogers. And um, Rogers uh, did this magnificent um, sculpture. I, I think it's in the Historical Society's collection, or one of them is. We have many Rogers in our collection, yeah. That's right, uh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. the, including one about phrenology, where he makes fun of phrenology, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, Rogers' slave auction um, displays this kind of moving portrait of this kind of leering auctioneer um, and this woman who's being auctioned off holding uh, her child. Um, and along the, there's, a, you know, next to her is a sign reading great sale of horses, cattle, Negroes, and other farm stock. To me, I think that sort of conveys the, this period, right? You had this mass mm -hmm. suspension of empathy mm -hmm. um, for the 4 million Blacks enslaved. And instead of getting really rich or famous, he would get uh, uh, attention later for a sculpture he did of Lincoln. But um, he has um, a, a guy trying to sell these on push carts. <laughs> um, and um, he realizes, I came to the wrong city. <laughs> uh, you know, because these things don't sell, even though occasionally abolitionist press write about it. The other, uh, 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 the last one I'll bring up is um, artistic figures, is Winslow Homer. And uh, Winslow Homer is an illustrator like Nast for Harper's. Um, he's he's writing for Harper, uh, illustrating for Harper's at this time. Nast isn't yet. Um, and, and Winslow Homer does this um, you know, origin of Christmas, um, his holiday image, which um, almost reminds me of a Bruegel, like the way that it takes a, a tableau of everyday life that appears to say nothing about the times, but says everything about the times, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and so you have an up and coming Bruegel Homer here too. Oh, it's just they're, they're, the the narrative is so rich with all of the characters like this. Those are just a little smattering, but I, I see that we're running a little bit short on time. So I want to go to our questions, of which we have many. Um, and I think one thing that that's interesting. So one of our um, audience asks you about this idea of tectonic shifts, and one of them around this time is the Industrial Revolution. How does it intersect or influence? How does it intersect with or influence the moment that you're that you're studying? 
Is it seen as a threat to the status quo? Does it accelerate the course of events? There's a really, um, so, so labor politics uh, don't quite, aren't quite what they're going to be after slavery. Um, slavery is this kind of um, uh, uh, sort of fulcrum about which um, the debate happens, right, around labor. So uh, in my chapter for February, actually, um, about 20% of the workplaces in um, New York City are steam powered. Mm -hmm. So uh, the beginning of February, I, I, my immediate answer to the person's question is not well. <laughs> Uh, so in the beginning of February, you have a few events, a distillery in um, Brooklyn, uh, in Williamsburg, explodes. I mean, um, a, a giant boiler explodes. Um, and um, it's this kind of, in, in the, the February chapter opens with bricks landing several blocks away, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the next day, um, an inquest allow us marvelous records of kind of when things happened and how they happened. And so um, the next day, a hat factory explodes, steam powered as well, right? Because the pressure on the boiler was too high. Mm -hmm. um, and um, around that time, there was a factory fire in Ma Massachusetts, the biggest industrial disaster or one of them up to that time, right? I think it might have been the biggest, about 150 people killed in it in Massachusetts. So labor is very much a topic of discussion at this time. Interesting dynamic here, though, uh, the conservative New York Herald is writing these pieces about these industrial disasters um, that almost could sound, you know, out of the pages of Karl Marx, right? <laughs> Um, and they have a reason for doing so. Uh, they they they're saying, you know, there, there's this passage where um, free labor, right? And that's the the idea put forward by a lot of abolitionists and anti-slavery people um, that we should, you know, um, it's it's the better alternative to slavery. The conservative papers are attacking that. So you have this weird bipartisan dynamic where. Um, you know, the, the New York Herald is saying, well, these capitalists don't care about their workers, right? Um, and um, on the other side of things, you have the Tribune, which again is publishing Karl Marx saying, they sound like a bunch of socialists, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, we do have we do have some labor strikes, some smaller ones, but 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 we haven't had things like the Wagner Act and things like that later. Organized labor is not represented. This is not quite the Gilded Age because slavery is kind of this elephant in the room. And I think a lot of the, the radicals at that time were sort of defending this system of free labor, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, here's another question, which maybe relates to this. Um, how were immigrant and ethnic cultures the same or different in civic life and politics at the time? Uh, yeah, right. Uh, um, there was quite a big... Um, a, you know, they, they were having a, quite a big impact. Um, the, the biggest groups at this time were um, Irish, um, secondarily German. Um, the latter were coming from, um, you know, a lot of them were um, refugees from 1848, right? So there's a lot of foment, a lot of, a lot of uh, what was a series of failed revolutions, right? Um, people like Carl Schurz, who would come to New York, um, there's a park named after him uh, on the Upper East Side. Uh, Your crazy mansion, right? <laughs> they are bringing labor politics into um, the discussion. Um, so it's not quite the 1870s, right, or the 1880s, where this kind of dynamic between capital and labor becomes um, a, a really central theme, right? Um, but we're getting there. I, I think the seeds of the Gilded Age are kind of getting planted and a lot of new ideas are coming over, um, um, coming over from Europe, especially, um, especially among the German population, right? Um, they're not like fleeing um, destitution. Um, they're, they're, you know, coming to bring, you know, a lot of social change. And so they were very avid uh, about doing that. They were, they were, communist papers that were also abolitionists. It's hard to find both, right? 
um, mm -hmm. a, a lot of the um, Irish labor agitation um, was pretty well ensconced in the Democratic Party, kind of still promoting um, the old regime in a lot of quarters, right? Mm -hmm. But Fernando Wood's pro-slavery speech is often at the same time to get the Irish vote and support um, were- Fernando Wood, the, with the, he was mayor. At the oh, time. excuse me, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah Fernando yeah. Uh -huh. Wood was right. the mayor at this time. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you had um, a populist politics under underlying it, you know, um, they, they, uh, in the Democratic Party. So, okay, here, here's a question that's on the minds of uh, a number of our audience. And this is, that is, uh, did the New York secessionists want to join the Confederacy or did they envision the city becoming a separate country? Uh, don't see how anyone could reasonably think that either choice might be a possibility. <laughs> they, Fernando Wood was was kind of a secessionist unto himself. Um, <laughs> you know, he gets up, um, and you know the the dominoes are falling. South Carolina has succeeded. It's January 1861, and he actually um, the the former right. He says that. Um, you know, he thinks that um, New York should become a kind of city state. In an odd way, it's almost uh, a little visionary because Brooklyn is a separate city. He says we should become something called Triinsula, right? Encompassing almost today's post 1898 when, when the boroughs merged that map. Um, and so, you know, the, the reason being to keep that cotton business going, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, it does seem absurd. And in fact, it seemed absurd at the time. Um, a few months later, there's a rally of 200,000 people in Union Square. The wind is blowing in a much different way. Um, the pro-slavery papers like the Herald are pro-union. And so we have Fernando Wood. Oddly, Trump did this too, right? Hugged a flag. <laughs> Fernando Wood would be hugging a flag later. Um, so, so, you know, it was a very short-lived idea uh um um his uh succession speech he had he had uh tried to become a national politician by being the voice pro-slavery voice of the north mm -hmm. um so let's talk about just we're, we're um, we are kind of out of time but i want to continue this conversation because there's so many rich questions and so much rich information that you're providing us with but um here's one about the enslaved uh, communities of enslaved people um who successfully escaped to New York, were you able to uncover anything about their lives or, or works um, that they might have published or you know, anything about you know, these stories? Oh, oh yeah. Um, so um, there was a slave living on West, West 20th Street at this time. Her name was Lena Fields. Um, and uh, some Southern merchants had brought her in um, and, um, once word got out, she, she escaped and actually took the bedding and the sheets and so on with her. And she was later confronted on the streets by her former master. You can imagine that conversation, right? Yeah, exactly. um, another, uh, another is uh, Harriet Jacobs was writing um, incidents in the life of a slave girl um, uh, uh, just upstate. Um, and um, she uh, writes this very vivid um, very vivid uh, narrative about her life as a slave, as an escapee. Um, yeah, there, there are really a lot of stories like that. Um, mm -hmm. There was a John Thompson who was actually abducted and, and uh, uh, by the end of the year and um, taken south by slave catchers. Um, so um, yeah, uh, there, there's a litany of stories like that. Um, and slave ships were being outfitted um, and, and headed uh, um, to, to Africa to pick up slaves and take them to Cuba often. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so uh, we're almost out of time and I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the archives of, Patric of the Patricia D. Klinkenstein Library at the New York Historical Society. How, um, which, what's your methodology? What, what have you looked at? Do you have any favorite um, materials that you, you found, uncovered or used that helped you depict this time and place? You do have another, what do we have, five or six hours? <laughs> um, so uh, the, um, you know, um, the archives are very deep uh, in this time period. Um, I, I am in there, um, you know, um, 
several days a week, um, just doing everything I can to kind of piece together um, the records. And um, there is so much that really stands out. Um, here is the arrest warrant for an abolitionist. I, I printed it, my own copy of it. Wow. Um, by uh, Congress. He was living in New York. Um, he was a prominent businessman and had um, provided some, some funding for John Brown. Um, and he ends up making a big mockery of the whole congressional process. His name was Thaddeus Hyatt, and you have the Thaddeus Hyatt collection um, mm -hmm. of files. Um, and that's one I've been digging through. You can piece together a picture uh, uh, of, of, of the time through broadsides uh, and things like that. And here is a P.T. Barnum. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but a, um, a, a highly racist de depiction of um, uh, uh, really a sign of the times. Um, and, um, you know, these types of artifacts, I think, um, tell us sort of uh, um, what you know well they 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 take us back to the time um you know origin of the species had just been published and pt barnum had hired um uh an african american and um dressed him up as what he called the missing link right mm -hmm. um in response to charles darwin um a, another favorite of the diaries there are many but i'll name one uh philip hamilton hill who ends up going to fight in the civil war so his trajectory i think is very much uh i think in line with the idea of the fog of history because he's very apolitical but he loves being in new york he's a quintessential new yorker um and he describes in detail day after day after day after day like he goes out to shows sees edwin booth perform he um, goes and sees um, the um, uh, Japanese embassy visit. He's enamored of the city. He goes to goes to rallies because he likes the frisson, right? He's not particularly political, um, ends up fighting in the Civil War, right? Um, so you have this whole narrative arc. By the way, what he cares about the most is Emma Chatterton, who was his uh, girlfriend, oh, okay. who he stole away from another, another uh, guy, right? Um, and he even writes that confrontation down. So that is a really fun example of daily life. Here's a slave bill um, uh, that I found by Howell Cobb, who was the Secretary of the Treasury. Um, and he was in New York in October during the election, going to various uh, business leaders, um, trying to promote succeeding from the United States if um, Abraham Lincoln wins the election. Um, and so this is a receipt of slaves that he lends to um, he lends to the Confederacy in 1864. And it's quite moving. Um, name Isaiah, age 50, black, $2,500. Name Prince, 21, skin color, copper, $4,000. It's a rental agreement wow. for human yeah. beings, right? Yeah. And I think these are the types of things that bring, I think, um, you know, this time period to life um, in a kind of uh, honest way. Uh, mm -hmm. I have the weather reports four times a day, um, each day in New York. Um, and that was something that was extremely important to New York because it was a soggy winter that year. Interesting. Interesting. So you, you I, I'm sure your challenge is, is delimiting uh, all of this information that you've got uh, together. Um, and so, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it truly is like trying to take a few sips out of a broken fire hydrant, right? There's just <laughs> so much. Um, and and um, uh, uh, the 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 uh, depths of the collection of the Klingenstein for this time period is amazing. No, um, I, I'm almost in awe. Well, we we are in awe of the uh, research you've done and have had such a wonderful time having you as a colleague and and in our midst and in the library. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, but unfortunately we have run out of time and I know we could go on for hours on this. So I guess we're just gonna have to wait for the book. Uh, which we'll be very excitedly anticipating. Uh, I wanna thank Josh Leon for being with us today. Um, and for the rest of you, please sign up for our mailing list and follow us at nyhistory.org to get the latest on upcoming fellows talks like this one. Finally, the New York Historical Society is currently open Tuesday through Sunday 
You can reserve your timed entry museum tickets on our website. We hope to see you on Central Park West to view exhibitions uh, such as Undercover, J.C. Lyon Decker and, the America, and American Masculinity, and Nature Crisis Consequence, in addition to our numerous other offerings. Thank you all again, and have a great night.